Today's video contains massive spoilers for Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. This is the ultimate spoiler video where we break down the ending. As such, nothing is off the table. Please complete Final Fantasy VII Rebirth and then return to this video when you have. With that being said, let's get into it. Back in 2020, Final Fantasy VII Remake released, and it came with a brand new, unexpected element, the Arbiters of Fate. These beings were described to come from and protect a future timeline that gave shape to them. In the context of the game's narrative, that means protecting the OG timeline. The end of Final Fantasy VII Remake would see us defeating the Arbiters, with Sephiroth pulling them into his wing, and the consequence of this would be that fate is no longer fixed in place. We have defied destiny, but contextually, no one knew what that actually meant. Things are no longer guaranteed to happen, but that could mean any multitude of things, many people under the assumption that this meant that Aerith could survive her fate. Furthermore, there was an even bigger mystery of Zack Fair, who seemingly survived the events that led to his death in the original game. The change of stamp on the stamp bag from a beagle to a terrier heavily implied the existence of a multiverse. For many who rejected the notion of FF7 leaning into a multiverse, theories about how this could all be happening inside the livestream, a sort of dream of the dead, gained some popularity on social media. But trailers made it increasingly clear people who were still well and alive were shown interacting with Zack. And then when the game came out, it was finally made clear. We are in fact dealing with multiple timelines. Or instead of timelines, the game calls them worlds. For many, this direction is hard to believe. Even for myself, I thought maybe they were doing a single altered timeline. But the truth is, my original assumption back in April 2020 when Final Fantasy VII Remake released was more accurate than any of the theories that came after. This is the Final Fantasy VII Multiverse. And if you thought that Final Fantasy VII Remake's ending was told in an incredibly esoteric and ambiguous way, where would one even begin to describe Final Fantasy VII Reapers? The previous chapter ended with Cloud and Aerith falling together into the unknown after the collapse of the Temple of the Ancients. You'll see that there is a common theme of falling into an arbiter-filled abyss and going to different worlds that is played upon a lot in this ending. We see a scene of Zack trying to make up his mind about who to save and what to do, each one of these paths representing a new potential world that could be born, showing just how pivotal each choice can be. Cloud finds himself awakening in Aerith's house, bewildered that he is somehow back in Midgar in the first place. Aerith has told him to consider this a dream, more specifically her dream. Let's just call it a dream. My dream, to be precise. This is puzzling, and at first, one may wonder if they're in the Terrier timeline or some other place. However, it's when Cloud and Aerith stop at a merchant here that we notice Stamp is an entirely different breed of dog again. Of course, prior to this, we had only seen Stamp as a Beagle and a Terrier. These denoted the only two timelines that we thought existed. This is confirmed yet again when they go and pick out some snacks, and we see a brand new version of Stamp. We are in a different third world that we never knew existed prior. The game then shows a sky torn apart by a rift of light, the same as it has been in Zack's Terrier world, with both worlds being alluded to as being dying worlds. Sephiroth's feathers are then shown and he notes that Aerith is hiding from him in this world. When Aerith noted that this world is a dream of hers, it could be that she created this branch in the timeline, or it could be that this existing world was her most ideal. These are the two ways in which I read this dialogue. But then things take a turn for the weirder. We hop over to see Zack with Biggs yet again. Biggs has a big bag of stamp chips. This denotes that we are now in the pug timeline. And this scene is both hilarious and messed up. Biggs lamenting why he survived when the others died, and Zack telling him how much he means to other people, only for him to be shot dead like seconds later. Bro is literally just explaining that he was an NPC compared to the main characters, and then he got the most NPC treatment ever. We then see another Zack in another timeline sitting outside of the church, who is shot into the multiverse by an approaching Sephiroth. Presumably, in this same timeline, Aerith and Cloud are inside the church, and the Aerith of this timeline, unlike the Aerith of the Beagle timeline, possesses an active white materia. I do find Aerith's 
tedious to say. So if you hear me saying heiresses to mean multiple heiresses, it's just literally easier for me to say. But it would seem that all the heiresses across the various timelines commune, sharing a consciousness and memories together. Of course, it's been alluded to that other people have this ability. As previously in the game, Biggs and Zack are able to recall memories they have from other worlds. If you're a Steinsgate fan, it really reminds me of the reading Steiner ability, where one can recall past world lines, even when history has been rewritten. Cloud falls into the rift between worlds, where Sephiroth then reveals to him what is described as the true nature of reality. Behold, the true nature of reality. When the boundaries of fate are breached, new worlds are born. The planet encompasses a multitude of worlds, ever unfolding. Some quickly perish, while others endure. Yet even the most resilient worlds are doomed to fade. Nevertheless, their loss is not to be mourned. For it is not death, but a homecoming that awaits them. And in the planet's embrace, all life is as one. All born are bound to her. Should this world be unmade, so too shall her children. As explained by Sephiroth here, every time the Arbiters are defied, new timelines are created as a result. He says that the planet hosts a multitude of worlds, which implies that all these worlds somehow simultaneously exist within the planet itself, and all are different expressions of the planet's fates, and are separated by time and space. Final Fantasy XIV's reflections of a theorist come to mind when you think of this. Fourteen different worlds that overlap, but yet are separated by a dimensional rift. Sephiroth's end goal has always been reunion, and while previously this simply meant Genova cells reuniting, this now means something much grander, the reunion of all timelines, all worlds. Again, one cannot help but think of Final Fantasy XIV's Emmett Selk, who sought to rejoin all 14 reflections and restore the original world. This scene then transitions by showing us the same visual effect that is used to indicate a battle is being fought in Cloud's mind. The exact same tunneling effect takes us to the edge of creation and remake and is also used in Final Fantasy VII OG, and almost always depicts Cloud and Sephiroth dueling in an isolated space, though this time it ends with Cloud outside of the Forgotten Capital with the active white materia in hand, with the heir at the VAR timeline taking it back and handing Cloud the now deactivated white materia. With Aerith leaving Cloud behind, the white whispers prevent him from stopping her. As they approach the capital, Sephiroth yet again takes center stage, and explains that the reunion is when spite and sorrow will feed the planet and the worlds will merge. It's upon us. The reunion. When worlds merge. When spite and sorrow are harvested. To feed the planet. This leads us into a fight with the White Whispers, which open a portal and lead to the planet's sanctuary, and eventually to the altar where Aerith is praying. Here, both the White and Black Whispers work together to prevent Cloud from stopping Aerith's coming demise. And just like in the original game, there is a moment in which Cloud lifts his sword to strike Aerith down. Key difference here is that judging by Cloud's face and his struggles here, he seems to be fighting the Whispers compelling him to do it. Normally, I would say it's Genova and Sephiroth doing this, as that happens has been a much common theme throughout the game, and indeed that's what was happening in the original game. However, from Cloud's facial expressions, it seems that he's still actively in control, and the whispers are the ones urging him to do this. However, in the last second, he's able to break free of their control. This then ends with Cloud deflecting Sephiroth's sword in a moment that everyone has been predicting since they first saw the ending of the last game. However, what happens next may have been a little bit less predictable.
Despite the sword being deflected, a time correction happens and Aerith still dies. Fate actually cannot be defied, go figure, with blood being shown dripping down from Aerith. But things aren't what they seem. It appears as though this could actually be two separate timelines. One where Cloud successfully saved Aerith and one where she died. And Cloud is able to exist in both of these timelines simultaneously and able to see things from them. Remember that Zack and Biggs were discussing how even though their timeline was changed, they had memories from the Beagle timeline and wondered how they suddenly ended up in the now Terrier timeline where everything had changed. Something of this nature is happening to Cloud. He remembers the timeline where he saved Aerith, but he still exists in the timeline where he didn't. Keep this in mind because it's going to come back time and time again. Of course, the flower girl's hair and white materia go down just like in OG, but this is also where things get even more weird. While we see Cloud talking to Aerith and she's comforting him, still talking to him, caressing his face, the camera then cuts to the rest of the gang who notably see something slightly but profoundly different. They just see Aerith lying there with her already passed away, with her eyes already closed, and yet when Cloud sees her, her eyes are wide open. The party, she's laying there unconscious, dead, and it just gets weirder and weirder with you seeing the strange static effect, which is usually used to indicate Sephiroth and Genova's meddling on Cloud's mind. Sephiroth then begins to monologue unintelligible things about his reunion. He loves doing that. And he also does that in OG. Although in OG, Sephiroth talked about the planet and the cycle of nature. He also tells Cloud that none of his feelings are real, and he should quit pretending. Here is notably different. And so it begins. A confluence of worlds and emotions. Moss, chief among them. It engulfs fleeting moments of joy, transforming them into rage, sadness, hatred. Never have I felt them so keenly. I got this. Sephiroth says the confluence of worlds requires Cloud to feel emotion. The most important among them is loss. Of course, this also ties into the fact that throughout the journey, Sephiroth has told Cloud, Hold on to that hatred. Noting that these strong emotions seem to be felt by multiple versions of these characters across different timelines. Which is why, for example, characters like Biggs and Zack can recall feelings of previous timelines. I suspect this is why strong feelings of loss and despair are key to the confluence of worlds and key to Sephiroth's reunion. But ultimately, I'm just glad that Sephiroth went to therapy and realized how hurtful and validating Cloud's emotions truly was. Again, Aerith's eyes are wide open. Cloud's talking to her, even though the party was running toward her and she was already seemingly unconscious. After the fight with Genova Life Clinger ensues, the party is surrounded by the White Whispers and Zack bumbling in a void of white. This same void of white is often used throughout the compilation to depict the life stream. For example, in Advent Children, Zack and Aerith can be seen standing in this white light. And in episode intermission, Zack stepping out of that white light symbolized his return to life. At first, Cloud can't really perceive Zack, though that all changes when Zack touches him. They're pulled into the edge of creation together and team up to fight Sephiroth. This was a really great moment for me, not because I enjoyed this type of fan service, but because everyone who told me that Zack and Cloud fighting Sephiroth together after the end of 
remake was not going to be a thing that happens, now owes me $5. This reunion isn't able to get too emotional as the fight immediately ensues, and upon its end, Sephiroth separates the two, with Zack begging him to save Aerith. This is intriguing to me. Perhaps it's as simple as Zack doesn't know that Aerith is dead yet, or that the Aerith from his timeline isn't, and there's a bit of confusion. After all, Zack is aware that Sephiroth is going to attempt to kill Aerith, so it's hard to say. We'll see in a later scene that the Zack here is an actual Zack from another timeline, presumably Terrier. So this isn't just a mental projection of Zack in Cloud's mind or anything alike. Meanwhile, Zack is being carried back to the church by the Whispers, where he fights Sephiroth Reborn by himself, followed by it going back to the main party to finish off. He then returns to Cloud in his humanoid form, where one of the most controversial parts of the ending takes place. Aerith walks out of a portal looking just fine and fights Sephiroth alongside Cloud. There is heavy debate on whether this is an actual Aerith from varying timelines or is simply an Aerith manifesting in his mind. Sephiroth even posts poses a similar question here. Is this really happening? Is Aerith actually standing beside him? This goes back to one of the very first taglines revealed for the game. What is fact? What is fiction? As the lines throughout this entire ending are heavily blurred. Finishing the fight, the White Whispers under Aerith's control take Cloud and Zack back to their respective homes. Aerith is also seemingly taking herself back to the world she belongs to, which results in her now lifeless body lying at the altar. He tells Aerith to wake up and to Cloud, she does. Her eyes light up and she awakes. Everything is good, guys. We saved Aerith. Except we kind of didn't. Notably and controversially absent is the scene where Cloud lowers Eris's body into the water. Instead, we see everyone looking down, completely demoralized about what we presume is Eris's death. Cloud then has a flash of memory from the death scene as it happened. He then looks over and sees Aerith beside him, with him sitting there smiling to himself. This scene is incredibly eerie to me. The girl who everyone just saw die, Cloud is still seeing in his head and is smiling at her. And with the music that's playing here, I don't think it's intended to be a thing where he just remembers her in his head. Tifa has an entirely different expression on her face that is absolutely on the verge of tears. The stuff with Glenn is like the stuff that like interests me the least so far. So we'll come back to this in another video. Moving forward, we see that the weapons are successful in fending off against Genova infected whispers as a result of the party's success. Zack wakes up in the church and confirms that he was actually there, present in the fight alongside Cloud. This of course creates even more ambiguity on the presence of Aerith, because if Zack was actually there, was Aerith actually there as well? Zack then contemplates if it's possible for worlds to join again or not, for him to have a chance to see Cloud and the others, and this will likely be the focus of his arc in the next game, where Zack seeks to go to other worlds and eventually reunite with the party. A scene then plays in Nibelheim with the rogue men and the Black Whispers all headed toward one direction, with the best assumption being that they are all headed for the Northern Crater. And if you thought all of that was wild, this is where things get even more insane. Cloud stares at the deactivated white materia, as the party fixes up the tiny Bronco. Of course, he can see Aerith during this scene. What's insanely curious to me is that Aerith's spirit can be felt by Nanaki, it seems, as him and Tifa are mourning her loss. It's worth noting that after Aerith, Nanaki is the most connected to the planet, so it raises a lot of questions and makes this a deeper mystery than Cloud just perceiving her to himself. He then seemingly finds a black materia in his pocket. There is a bit of debate here. Are these two different materias? Or did the clear, translucent, deactivated white materia somehow become a new black materia? Personally, I currently lean toward the latter, that the deactivated white materia became a black materia. After all, the translucent materia is going to have some type of major story impact. We don't know what that is yet, but it is going to do something eventually. And it would make some kind of sense for it to transform into a black materia somehow. Indeed, with the presence of multiple worlds, there 
there is more than one white materia, as we've already seen. This also implies multiple black materia. Cloud seems infatuated with the materia, as if under Sephiroth's control. The same audiovisual cues representing Genovaroth's control over him plays, and then he puts the black materia in the Buster Sword, though instead of slotting it in, it does this weird absorption effect, which is very eerie and kind of disturbing. There is a lot of conjecture on what this could mean. The result is clear. Cloud is carrying around a black materia that the rest of his party doesn't know about. The bigger question is how all of these black materias are going to come into play, and specifically the one that Cloud's holding on to. Is it simply for Sephiroth's convenience, or can this somehow end up being a foil for Sephiroth in the third part? The easy thing to assume is he'll hand it to him at a later point, but we've already had that happen in the events of Chapter 13. Sephiroth is planning something else, something far more sinister. And I think I've said this so many times throughout this video, but somehow the next part gets even weirder. You have to promise not to look up. Don't look up. Well, now I gotta look. Fine, but don't let it get to you. Don't let what get to me? It's not real. Just an illusion. Aerith tells Cloud not to look up, to which Cloud quite firmly tells the party to not do so as well. It reveals a massive tear in the sky, similar to the one we've seen in the dying world such as Zack's terrier timeline, but a far more distorted looking even. Bigger twist is that literally nobody else can see it. Cloud is now the only one who sees a living Aerith in a sky that is torn apart. And I'm going to say it again, it gets even weirder, because you have to factor in that the English version of Final Fantasy VII Remake Integrade recently received a patch, just as Rebirth was releasing, changing Era's final line of dialogue. I miss it. The steel sky. The sky. I don't like it. Of course, this new line of dialogue much more accurately reflects what she's saying in the original Japanese. They've made it much more clear that Aerith doesn't like the sky itself, and it's so important that they made an update to the game, this four-year-old game, to clarify that story point with a new voice line. I think this is a double reference here, not just to Midgar Sky and her being afraid of the sky as Crisis Core added, but on a deeper level, what's happening here is that Aerith might have always had the perception of some warped sky. Again, why go to the trouble of patching a four-year-old game right before its sequel comes out to make it explicitly clear she's talking about how she doesn't like the sky when the original line, I miss it the still sky, made that clear enough. Of course, that's not the plot point that they wanted to make clear. It was that in fact, she does not like the sky itself. Curious. Cloud continues talking to Aerith and shows active concern for her. Of course, this is odd because if there's someone who is truly dead, you wouldn't really show that type of concern for them. Sure, something can happen to her within the live stream, I suppose, but it seems more to me that Cloud genuinely believes that Aerith is not dead. It's also why he's likely unfazed by her death in general, unlike Tifa and Nanaki. Aerith also tells Cloud that she's going to stop Meteor, but this is also a bizarre statement narratively too. She's basically spelling out the end of Final Fantasy VII as we know it. The only reason I can think of for her simply giving away the ending is if things are going to play out in a fundamentally different way, and this is their way of setting up for a subversion. This is already something we've seen happen in the first two games, where their ending segments go completely off the rails. Hence, I'm making this analysis video in the first place. Thus, it only stands to reason that the third and most climactic part will go completely and utterly off rails, and that's exactly what I'm betting on. So, putting it lightly, this new ending took a lot of new risks. At the same time, it's kind of exactly what I thought this project was going to be back when I finished Final Fantasy VII Remake in April 2020. This is a multiverse spanning story. In fact, something I used to always say for those that tuned into my streams was that there's no way there is only two timelines, because if the Arbiters disappeared from all points in history, then there would either have to be one timeline or infinite timelines, but there's no way that there's conveniently just two and one where again conveniently Zack survives. That never made sense to me. Looking at this ending now, I know I was on the right trail. 
as a result, it was really hard to have a visceral reaction in the same way that I had with Final Fantasy VII Remake, because I kind of saw all of this coming a mile away. The only thing that may have really surprised me was the black materia and the rip in the sky. However, it wasn't really shocking in that way. Everything that was set up in Remake paid off in Rebirth. But I know the bigger question you guys have is how do I truly feel about the ending? Have I changed my mind? Have my feelings evolved? And the answer to that question is 